Hey everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 455. Today we're going to take a look at Food Chain Magnate. Now this is the latest release from Splotter and they do games that are usually very unique and odd and have different kinds of themes but are relatively heavy in crunchy euros and Food Chain Magnate is definitely no exception. Now it plays two to five players and it is a game where you have a lot of logistical things to worry about in terms of starting your own fast food franchise and you can sell a variety of things burgers and pizzas and different drinks and everything like that and it has a modular board and so you'll be putting out different restaurants in your chain and then doing advertising campaigns trying to sort of lure away and steal away potential customers from other players you'll kind of set up good neighborhoods you might actually reinvest in the community so to speak uh, but it does it in a completely different way from just about any game that I've ever ever played except for one which is also a splatter game of the great Zimbabwe uh, so we'll leave more of that for the end of the review, but let's jump into how the game works, which is actually really simple and straightforward until you actually try to win the game. <laughs> and then that's where all the crunchiness comes in. So let's take a look at how it works and I'll tell you what I think of it. Now, like I said, Food Chain Magnate is all about setting up your own fast food chain and all of the components and everything in the game have kind of a sort of retro 50s uh, look and feel to the game. A very sparse and almost to the point where I've seen several people call it like a prototype looking game and I would have a hard time arguing with that with them but I disagree uh, I think it actually it does evoke sort of not only this era in terms of the theme but also this era in terms of gameplay components I might be copping out a little bit there but I don't think so now the first thing you're going to do is set up a board and there are a bunch of these random tiles here and they can be twisted and turned all kinds of different ways and depending on the number of players you're going to have a different configuration so here I've randomly set up a board for a three player game and then each player is going to get three tokens here sort of in their color or in their chain so we can see this is the golden duck diner and zango blues and also fried and donkey and so the first thing each player is going to do in reverse turn order is place these out onto the board and you can see this has the entrance to uh, the restaurant there so what you're going to try to do is place this adjacent to a road that is connecting to a lot of these houses you can see the different houses here they've got numbers this is numbers indicating the order in which they will sort of activate at the end of each round and the one thing to note about the game is when something says uh, you have a range of one or two Two, what you're usually going to do is count from your entrance and go via the roads you've got to have a connecting road path here and you the range is the number of tiles so this house here is within range one of this restaurant as well as this restaurant here because you can connect to it with the road and it's one tile away and you can see here is actually the turn order track and you can see each player has a little turn order token this will change up it's random at the beginning of the game but there is a, a sort of mechanism for dictating that during the game and then each player is going to get a little set of cards here now each player is going to get a ceo and the ceo is going to be you for example and the ceo has an ability to hire one person so everybody's going to have that ability to start the game and you can see there are three slots underneath them so you're going to be building starting with the ceo this like tr a tree and pyramid of different people that you're going to hire and all those people are going to give you abilities to do stuff on the board and then each player gets three reserve cards 100 200 and 300. now the bank is going to be seated with 50 dollars per player or there's a variant where you can play with 75 dollars per player and you're going to put that much money in the bank leave the rest out in the box and then the game is going to end when the bank is depleted twice however the first time the bank is depleted what's going to happen is there's going to be one card from each player that is put in the reserve at the very beginning of the game before anybody's done anything so you can see here let's say there were three players and i put in 100 and then billy put in 200 and then frankie put in a 300 and so just for argument's sake we'll choose that they could have, we could have all put in 100. so when the bank depletes we're going to reveal the cards that were put in the reserve and then we're going to re-add this much money back to the bank so in this case we'd have another 600 dollars into the bank so that's going to actually dictate the length of the game because the second time you go through all of the money in the bank 
that's going to signal the end of the game. So, spoiler alert, this is awesome. <laughs> now, it's going to make more sense, I think, as I just explain the game a little bit also as you play it, but there are some strategies where you want the game ending sooner rather than later and vice versa. And so you kind of have to be a little bit mindful about that when you put it in. And maybe for the first time you play, you might think back to other Euros and say, you know what, I'm kind of more of a slow engine building kind of player or you know, I'm more of an aggressive player, so I'll put in the 100. I should say each player comes with this player aid, which is actually a menu, shows you all of the things you do on the turn, which is very straightforward, and then it gives you a breakdown of all of the different employees and things that you can hire. And these are actually cards you're gonna set out onto the table. On the back here, at least on the English ones, uh, it has what each of the different marketing campaigns can do. So you can put up billboards, do like a mail order campaign, uh, flyovers with airplanes and then also a radio campaign and you'll put those out on the board and they'll affect the board in different ways and this kind of reminds me how each of those work you're actually going to set out several piles of all of these cards this is going to take up a lot of room on the table and way more room than I have frankly uh, to set up within a camera frame but the thing to notice is that you're going to have several types of employees you can see I have these giant stacks of cards all of these are going to be available to a certain degree depending on the number of players and then you're going to have all of these milestones out as well and so one thing to note here is you can hire these new employees so all the employees with this little arrow here are going to be kind of like on the left side you just kind of set them up in sort of like a tech tree kind of you know hierarchy however you want the rules themselves actually give you a nice uh, you know pattern for setting them out in a way that makes sense and it is very accessible once you play i don't know a couple of turns you kind of get into where everything is and sort of the upgrade path so you can see you can hire a management trainee these are the, some of the cards with the little arrows but then later on you can do a training action or an upgrade action so they can they can go to these three types of things and then you can kind of scale them up and do all kinds of different stuff i'll talk more about that in detail and then they also give you a nice little pattern here for setting up all of the milestones. Now let's talk about the milestones. So all of these are gonna say something like first to do something. So this is first to hire three people in one turn. Now, if multiple people get this milestone on the same turn, there's gonna be multiple cards here of that, but only those people that do that on that original turn are gonna get this little bonus. So you can see, if we do that, you're gonna get plus two management trainees, which are uh, a different type of person to hire. Now, if you're the first one to produce a burger, you're gonna get a burger cook, which is another person you can hire. And for example, if you're the first one to place a billboard out onto the map there, you're going to be no salaries for marketers because you have to pay salaries sometimes. And then you get eternal marketing, which is awesome. And so all of these milestones, if you've played Great Zimbabwe, you're gonna know right away, this is like kind of like choosing uh, the God tiles. But you get these and then this will give you sort of a special ability or sort of a quick leg up in a certain sort of strategic approach but multiple people can get these and you have to in contrast with Great Zimbabwe you have to like do something to get it you don't just get to choose it so this is really really cool as well and this really honestly is basically the game in a lot of ways now who you hire and stuff is going to matter a ton a, a ton of stuff is going to matter how the board shapes out because obviously it's variable and random and you know at setup and then what other players do is going to affect you but this is really going to be a big part of your engine getting these little bonuses and you know being able to abuse a different types of people that you hire based on the milestones that you do so if you miss out on a milestone that's fine because there's a bunch of other milestones you can get i mean you can see there's a ton here and so that's really going to sort of combo with you know who you're hiring what kind of strategy you're doing but it's a big part of it to enhance and make your strategy that much more greasy and effective. So the game also comes with a bunch of these wooden pieces here, and these are a variety of things. You've got pizza here, and these little orange things like so. You've got these little brown burgers like that, and then they've also got a variety of these different drink uh, things. You've got lemonade and beer and soda and all kinds of stuff like that. And so these are the tokens you're gonna use to manage production and marketing and all kinds of stuff like that. And then of course, you're gonna have a variety of tokens, like here is a mail order campaign. You might put that out here, uh, and you might put a certain amount of a certain type of food or drink on it, and this is gonna sort of seed anything in, uh, based on the type of marketing it is, like this one will affect these two houses here, and so every turn is going to you know, put out uh, burgers. And so these new two neighborhoods or houses are gonna have a demand for that type of food. They're, you're gonna kind of get into their psyche. 
I'll talk more about in detail how the marketing works, but you might also actually put out some houses and you can see this one actually comes with a garden. Uh, sometimes you'll have a garden that you can add on to uh, other houses like this and that's gonna sort of increase the amount of demand that that particular house or neighborhood is capable of sustaining. And you've got like flyover campaigns. You'll put these on the side of the board. You can see that'll cover like an area like this, you know, going down these three squares and touching all the houses in there. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, like I said. So the first thing you're gonna do every round is put out any cards that you want to hire in one pile. And then you're gonna have cards that you want to put sort of on rest, they call it at the beach, in another pile. And then everybody's gonna reveal those and then you're going to create your structure of employees. Now, the first round, everybody just has a CEO, so that's all you do, you always have to put the CEO out. But let's say you had uh, acquired a recruiting girl and then a waitress. So for example, you might say, you know what, I'm not gonna use the recruiting girl this round, I'm just gonna put her aside. And then once we reveal, I'll show the hire one person from the CEO and then I'll have this ability also from the waitress. Now you might also have, this management trainee or another character like that. And you see this kind of branches out even further. So we might stick him under here. So now we've got it, that leaf comes there. This one splits into two and then we can daisy chain somebody off there. Maybe even another management trainee who you can then have you know, more and more stuff attached to. So once you reveal that, you're gonna establish turn order based on the number of open branches that haven't been closed off. So in this case, we have two because we have one person here. And then you're gonna rearrange turn order by whoever has the most open branches. And then you'll maintain turn order if there's a tie between two players. And then you'll take player turns in this order and each player will do all of these steps here. And you have to do them in this exact order. And a lot of the characters and things that you get in your display are gonna combo right with a lot of the different you know, actions that you can do. And then sometimes in this sort of dinner time phase, which I'll talk about in a minute. But so the first thing you can do is recruit employees. And you can do that here with this hire action. So you see, you come out with the ability to hire one person. So the first turn of the game, everybody's gonna hire one from a huge, again, variety of choice of any employees that have that little arrow there. So I might just pick up the waitress on the first turn. Or you might pick up, for example, the recruiting girl, and she's going to allow you to hire another person. So maybe on the next turn, we actually do put out the recruiting girl. And so this turn, we can hire two people during our recruit a new person phase. So again, the first thing you can do is recruit employees, and you can hire one here, but possibly more if you have more characters that allow that. Then you can do train employees, and then you need a trainer or a guru or some kind of employee that allows you to train. And you can train any characters that you put aside into your at the beach pile. So remember you divided it into two piles. You have some that are off to the side. Now you can only train people that are trainable. So for example, here we have a management trainee. This one shows you the different steps that you can hire him to. Now you have to sort of make that decision as you weigh this. You're like, okay, well, I want to put this guy out. He, you know, not, it's a couple of turns in. I gotta have you know, a lot more spaces to put a lot more people out, so I wanna put him out, but you know, some of the really cool things I can get to, I can get him to a junior vice president, I can get him to a luxury manager if I'm trying to exploit like one type of good, there's a whole bunch of strategies here. Um, but I have to keep him off a, a side to be able to train him. And again, you can take a look at the rule book, but also just inside your player aid, you can see you know, who can go to what and everything. The next thing you can do is initiate a marketing campaign. And of course you need somebody that's capable of that in your tree here. So for example, if we had this marketing trainee somewhere in our structure, then we could activate him during this part of the turn and place a billboard for a max duration of two. So what does that mean? Well, depending on the number of players, there's gonna be a certain number of billboards in the game and they're all different sizes. So let's say we took, decided to take this billboard and we'll put that there. It's got the 11 on there and all that means is we're gonna take a token here. So this is an 11, so this means this matches this. We're gonna take and sort of set aside the person that's marketing this and then put this outside of our structure uh, and it, so he won't be part of the structure. He won't be, you know, at the beach or at rest. He's going to be sort of set aside uh, for, in this case, two turns. Now you can get the ability I showed you earlier to have infinite, infinite marketing. And so what this means is this has a duration of two. So we're going to take two items. We're going to choose what to market. We can say, let's market pizza. And so we'll put that here and we'll put two on there. So at the end of this round, and then once again at the following round, this billboard is going to affect any of the houses and neighborhoods that are within its range based on it being a billboard. Now you can get other characters, like I said, that you can put out uh, airplane campaigns. We talked about the uh, 
mail order campaigns and so on, and they did work a little bit differently. So the billboard will affect anything that it touches. So for the first round, we'll take, we'll take one off of here and then anything that it affects, in this case just this one, we'll put one pizza on. The next round it'll come off and then this will go there and then this will come off the board and then this 11 here will come off our marketing guy and he'll go back and we'll be able to reuse them again to make a new campaign. But now this neighborhood really wants pizza. Again, you can put whatever good you want on there, a drink or whatever. And like I said, you can get that infinite marketing ability. So each of these has an infinity sign. And in that case, you would just put uh, one of the type of good you wanted to do. So let's say we wanted to do lemonade here. We'll put that there. So every round, this is going to generate lemonade. Now, how do these work differently? So like I said, the billboards affect whatever they touch. The mail affects anything that's sort of within its block. So anything that doesn't cross a road, so all these white spaces here, is gonna get affected by uh, the burger joint there. So these two houses, like so, will each get a burger demand, uh, at least in this case, let's say it was a duration of two, for the next two rounds. And then I talked about the airplanes. And again, the airplanes you sort of put on the side of the board, so let's put that there. And this will touch any houses here. So it'll go these three spaces, so it hit this house, this house, and then it's just going to nick that house there. So all three of these are going to get whatever we decided to advertise on there for the amount of turns that it was worth. And then a radio campaign is going to affect anything on its tile and then the surrounding adjacent tiles. So all nine of these tiles are going to be affected by this radio campaign. And to do that, you just need a different marketer that says to do that type of campaign. So like this one says billboard, another one will say put out an airplane campaign and so on. And there'll be different milestones and stuff. So like the first person to put out an airplane campaign, you can see here, will count plus two open slots when determining order of play. Because remember the number of opening slots in your tree is going to allow you to get earlier in turn order. So the next step after initiating any marketing is to get food and drinks. And there's a few types of folks here. This Aaron boy is the first one that you can hire. And this is get one drink of any type. So you just simply grab a, a drink here. So let's maybe grab a lemonade there and we just get that. Now, the other ones are a little bit more interesting. Let's get to the card operator. Get two drinks from each source on a route. So you can see he has a range of two. And we'll go to another one. This truck driver is get three drinks from each source on a route and he has a range of three. So what you do is, let's pick a guy here. Let's just pick this one. So we can now have a range of two in the case of the cart operator or three of the truck driver. So you start here from your open uh, entrance and then you go one, two, three, for example, or maybe one, two. So let's say we did the cart operator. We go one, two, so we have these sources here that are on our route, we can get two of each of those types of drinks and add that. So now we can advertise those, get people to demand those, and hopefully sell it to them. So that's how you collect all of the drinks. Now the food works a little bit differently. You're actually gonna have to produce those. So the first guy you're gonna get here is a kitchen trainee and he can produce a burger or a pizza. And then we can go up into more specialization. So a burger cook could do three burgers, a burger chef can do eight, and then there's the same for pizza, three pizzas and eight pizzas. And so those are actually gonna go onto the table right in front of you. So you're gonna have a collection of drinks that you've went out and sort of gathered, and then you're gonna get uh, you know, a collection of burgers and pizzas that you've actually produced uh, in your tree of, of folks. Now you gotta be very careful about that because at the end of the turn, you're gonna have to discard any of these that you don't sell uh, to any of these neighborhoods. Now the first person to have to discard you can see here, first to throw away drink and food at the end of the turn, they get a freezer. So they get this card, and it's gonna count as a freezer that can store 10 items, drink or food. So what that does is very important because it actually alleviates a little bit of the pressure to exactly match what you produce with what's demanded by these different neighborhoods based on the different marketing campaigns which are gonna generate all that. So that can be pretty big. And you can see here the next step is to place new houses and gardens, and then you can place or move restaurants. There's a couple of different sort of managerial types of folks that allow you to put out, like I said, new houses or attached gardens, and you want to put these in proximity to you know your restaurants, but the board's going to fill up very quickly, and you're also going to be able to place gardens, and this, like I said, this will increase the demand, because as you sort of generate demand, and we'll put out, let's say, you know, the burger will come off there, each of these gets a burger, and then the next turn they'll each get a burger. Now this one's full because it has three items on it. This one can have up to five items on it. And you can also, like it said, 
put out uh, new uh, restaurants and sometimes these have to say coming soon depending on which person you use to activate it. Some are really cool because you can put it out and it's active right away. Otherwise you have to put it coming soon and then at the end of the round you flip it up and then it's available to use. And then you're gonna go into the dinner time phase after each player has done all of their turns working nine to five and taking all these steps. Then you're gonna have to try to match the demand. And what's gonna happen is you're going to start with a base price for 10 bucks for each item. Now, players may or may not have different workers that affect the price that they sell the items for. So at the beginning, everybody sells the items for 10 bucks a piece, but if you have the pricing manager, you actually sell them for minus one, so $9 a piece. Now you may also get somebody later here, a discount manager, upgrade to that, you sell for minus $3, so you'd be selling everything for $7 a piece. Of course, if you had both, you'd be selling everything for $6 a piece. Now you might also try to corner the market on one type of good, and you're actually gonna increase the price by $10. That's a tricky thing to do, but let's explain why in a minute. So let's say that both the blue and the green player can satisfy this guy's demand exactly. Now you're gonna go through the houses in this order based on the number. So let's let's so we're on number eight here. And so if you can match exactly, then you're in the running to be able to sell and make some money. Now if this guy, let's say, only had two pizzas but no burgers, then it doesn't match the demand, so he's out of luck. But let's say they matched. And let's say this guy had the lower price. So let's say he was lower by three. He had the $3 minus. He didn't have any. So he's selling for 10 bucks each. He's selling for seven. But you're also gonna include the distance. So he's one away. So this is 10, 11. And then he's at seven, but now you can't get to him via this road here. You've got to go up through this way. So he's at seven, eight, nine, ten. So he still gets the, the price. Now he doesn't sell it for 10, he still sells it for seven. But when configuring the demand and where they're going to go, they're going to go the shortest route, plus or minus the cheapest amount. So they're still going to go to him, even though he's further away, they're going to save a buck um, instead of going to this guy. So he's going to sell, he's going to get 10, 20, 30, but he may also have some bonuses. So for example, if you were the first person to market a burger, to put a burger on a marketing spot, you get this ability and it's plus $5 for every burger sold. Now you calculate that after they've bought it. So you can really rake it in. So you might reduce the price, but then because you have this special milestone that you're gonna get extra $5 anyway for burgers. Now the other thing to keep in mind is anything with a garden is actually gonna give you twice the price as well. So in this case, you would get 20 plus whatever must remind your price and then add the bonus there so that's something else to keep in mind and after you've done that there are some other abilities that kick in you can have a waitress here who's just going to straight up give you three dollars or five dollars if you've got a special ability and you actually win ties against restaurants with fewer waitresses so if there's a tie in money then the more waitresses will give you the tiebreaker there you can also get a cfo card which gives you 50 percent on top of whatever you've already earned, so you take 50% of that and just get that at the end of the phase. Oh, I should say, actually, if you have a tie, even with waitresses, whoever's first in turn order actually goes first. So turn order is pretty big in this regard and a couple other things as well. And then you've got to go into a payday. So anybody that has this little icon here at the bottom of their card, you've got to pay $5 flat for. Now you can get other special abilities and characters and milestones that are going to reduce the cost of that. And you've got to pay everybody that, not only that you used here in your uh, your hierarchy and your pyramid, but anybody that you set aside into your at the beach pile on break, you still got to pay for them. So a lot of times when you train somebody, you'll upgrade them from somebody that you're not paying to somebody that you do have to pay. So you've got to be uh, wary of that as well. And sometimes the milestones will give you special abilities to acquire somebody, but then you're like, oh, I've got to pay for that person. But there's some you know gaminess that you can do with that, which is kind of neat. And then you can see here after the payday is when you actually resolve the marketing campaigns and that's when they will generate the goods and put them on the houses and then you go into cleanup again any food and drinks that you have are just discarded and then you actually flip up any new restaurants that you put out return any empty marketing campaigns as they run out you'll put them back on the off the board and then you take all of these back and then this at this point you're going to figure out who hit any milestones and then give them that. So you just keep playing until you've emptied the bank twice, and then whoever has the most money, of course, is going to be the winner. Okay, so that is a food chain magnate, and this is actually the last review of 2015 for me before I do my end of year, best of year videos, and this game is going to show up on that list. <laughs> uh, I love this game, it's awesome. Uh, first thing, a player count. It plays well with two, and it also plays well with more. I haven't played
played it with five, but uh, the game length is going to scale for sure with uh, more players. Uh, the box has two to four players, and I think once players get to know the game, it's going to play at a little bit better of a clip, but certainly once you add more players, it's going to take longer. There's just a lot more going on and everything, but it plays, I think, equally well uh, with, with more, two and more. So with two, the thing that you miss, though, is you don't... I only played it once with two, so yeah, I, I would think that you usually will not have people doing like the same strategy. Uh, because like I said with the milestones, once you hit some of those, it's going to sort of enhance and you're going to be sort of, you know, kind of wanting to abuse those little powers that you've got. Now, if everybody is doing the exact same thing, that's more likely with uh, more players to have more players doing like the same thing. So a couple of strategies, first of all, like the waitress. If you get the waitress early, it's just a way of kind of like generating free money uh, without really having to do much. And that's really cool and good. But you could kind of go to the strategy of like being the first to throw away your food and then you get that storage. So you have to worry less about timing your marketing exactly, you know, with or timing your production, excuse me, with marketing that's happening. Uh, and the other thing is you can do is you try to get that elusive uh, infinite marketing, which can be really, really cool, but then other players can jump right on and take advantage of. So the two player thing, it seems to me like you would more often go in different strategies, which is cool. I like that because it's like, hey, you know what? I'm going to do this. You do this. And then we'll kind of play off each other and bounce off each other. And there's really a lot of game there. But you, and with you have more players, you might have multiple players doing like multiple same milestones and things like that and hiring kind of similar uh, sets of people. And that's really going to like I said, dictate how you play and everything. But the game is so like open-ended and everything where it's like, okay, I'm gonna put a house here and a marketing there and be like, cool, I'm gonna put a restaurant there and then take all that marketing work that you did because I'm gonna undercut you by cost. And so what I like about this game, it really reminds me of Great Zimbabwe. Not only the milestone grabbing, which is like the God thing, but it's also like you are messing with the market. Like not similar, but it feels similar to Great Zimbabwe where you know, you set up this whole cool engine of, you know, a cool campaign and, and there's houses there and somebody plops down and starts to build up a good neighborhood. But you're like, OK, I'm going to move a restaurant over there or plop that down. And then I, you've been working on building all that infrastructure. I've been working on, like, building these cheap burgers and stuff. And so people are going to come to me because they're really cheap and all that. But you can also, on the other hand, at least for a while, I've seen it where you can abuse that luxury tax gal and she's going to set a premium on the price. Now, if you're the only one offering this, the demand for a specific thing, then you're gonna be able to sort of take advantage of those people and sell at that increased price until somebody kind of catches up with you and undercuts you, and, you know, and then they start stealing it away from you. But you might be at the point where you can build up enough of a cash reserve to uh, sort of go out and spend and get more people and then you get your engine going so you can sort of shift strategies you know sort of in sort of the middle or late part of the game if you have one of those sort of early game uh, you know money engines so <laughs> the game is open-ended is what I'm trying to say and I think it's going to be open for abuse like Great Zimbabwe was that was one of the problems I had I didn't have with it I like that but it's one of the problems I had where if you play with people that like never played it before you could kind of wipe them all over the floor with it. And so that doesn't make for a great game experience. And I think this one is going to be open to that uh, for sure. Where you're going to be like, oh, I know that combo where I can do on turn one, I can get the waitress, get the ability, hire the other person and get this little engine going. And then I can shift over and really exploit the marketing thing. You know, you can just go on down these different paths and set yourself up and get to a point where like, I have this one strategy that I'm always going to want to do. And Joey always does that. And that's really boring to play with Joey because he always does the same strategy, which you could do in this. You could just kind of do it like this works really well for me. I'm going to do it. And it could be within a certain group that you somebody would find maybe the, the broken strategy that nobody else can beat. Now, I don't know that that exists here. Just the way everything's are sort of, um, how do you say it? Like there's sort of a gateway in front of doing certain strategies. You've got to go to like a two or three step process sometimes to get at some of the special abilities. I like that it's very different and it's a little bit better, I think, than Grades and Bob, where you're just like, mm, I'm going to do this God tile. Now, in that game, you could kind of randomize it so not all the same tiles were available. But I vaguely remember reading in that game there were some sort of broken y kind of things that happened with this. I don't think 
this is going to be susceptible to that, but I could be wrong, you know, maybe in a couple of months after more people have played it like 10 or 20 times, they figure out something. I don't think so, but just to kind of know that going in for your group, you might have a situation where like, gosh, you know, Joel seems really good at this game or Billy, and he's going to kick our butt every time, so it's no more fun. I like games like this where you can get in there and it's, the game is not like the levers and mechanics you can pull. It's all about, I don't know, I almost feel like I shouldn't be saying this, but it's more about the players. This one still has all those levers and stuff you can pull, but it's just like open-ended. It's n n Stuff isn't so interlocked that you like have handcuffs on. It's like a free-for-all. And there's so many different aspects. It's not just the people that you hire and not just the milestones. It's That's a big part of it. And I think people can get obsessed with that. And I've seen where somebody feels like they were out of it this person and then they sort of played the board more than the cards and then were able to catch back up and then not win the game but they <laughs> they actually did pretty well and like they thought where they were completely out of the game but they were not completely out of the game at all um, that being said it does feel like it's brutal and it is going to and this is why with more players it takes longer is you've got to really sort of like okay i kind of messed that up but if I do this and then this and this, well, is that going to work? Okay, he's going to do that. You know, you have to kind of, it can give you a little bit AP-ish because it's so open-ended. But I like it. it. It actually fits the theme really well, getting back to the whole production of it. It's sparse, you saw it. It looks like a game that was made in the 1950s and it has sort of similar 50s fonts and art and graphic design. But I think that's on purpose. I mean, that's a splatter thing. Uh, you know, if you go look at Great Zimbabwe, it's one of their more illustrated, whatever word that is, try it, style of game, so they are capable of doing that. Um, it does kind of look prototype-y, I can see that, but I think that's what they're going for. They're going for that like, hey, this game came out in the 50s. This is like a lost Euro that we found, you know, from the 50s. <laughs> um, and, you know, lost Sid Saxon game or something. And it has that vibe, and I really like that. And it's really, really cool and really well done. Um, yeah, I would say the the one thing about this game though, it's gonna cost you probably over hundred bucks. Now I traded away, I think four games for it <laughs> because I heard good things about it and I was like, Ugh, I can't I can't spend that much money on a game. You know, it's just it's too much, especially when you look at it. That's like the thing too is like if you look at that, and you go, God, and it's just sort of the zeitgeist of me. But it's like, okay, I'm gonna spend that much money on a game. Let's well, better have like some miniatures in it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why. If it's a dumb, really a dumb idea, but you, you kind of want your your weight in in pieces, I guess. But I, I don't know if this is worth 100, 125 bucks. I think if you have that money, and you, this game sounds interesting, I would get it because it's an amazing game. I think it's a great game. So that's kind of, that's a personal decision, though. That's for everybody. It's a one hundred percent personal decision. Price without, you know, not considering price. The game's great, I would get it instantly. So definitely take a look at it. I think you're gonna have a lot of fun, a lot of plays out of it. And if you're somebody that plays two player games, again, this one's gonna work good, especially if you have a, a group that you can also play it with. Okay, thank you.